All right. Uh, thanks for joining us today, everyone. Uh, we are going to have a very interesting discussion with uh, with a few experts in in the area of privacy and ethics uh, as it relates to AI. Uh, I have with myself today here Patricia, uh, Matt, and Omar. Uh, some of you might uh, saw uh, might have seen Omar a few days ago in our uh, legal tech and AI session. Uh, and he kindly agreed to join us again. Uh, I'm just going to briefly pause and let everyone to introduce themselves. Uh, Omar, uh, do you want to go first? Sure. My name is Omar Heredda. I am a uh, lawyer primarily based here in the areas that I focus on is areas such as technology law as well as privacy law. So I've done quite a bit of work in that area, but privacy law is almost like saying, um, I like to be a philosopher in law because there's not much by way of law when it comes to privacy. Fantastic. Uh, Matt, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm uh, Patricia. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto working on privacy preserving machine learning. And I'm also the CEO of a company called Private AI. And we create anonymization tools for developers to integrate into their uh, apps, browser extensions, or other software. Fantastic. Hi there. And Matthew. Hi, my name is Matthew Zaleski. I'm a lecturer at the University of Toronto Department of Computer Science. And one of the things I do is I try and teach the privacy law that Omar just referred to as, you know, pretty hard, pretty uh, <laughs> philosophical. Um, so looking forward to this discussion a lot today. I guess you, you can also uh, tell I'm a dog owner. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Uh, so, uh, awesome. So we're we are going to... Well, Matt also broke his ankle recently, so that is, explains the conscious. Uh, yeah, so we are going to talk about companies' responsibilities in dealing with uh, sensitive information of users. Uh, we've been seeing more data breaches, and so some questions that are coming up is how can we deal with situations like that? Uh, there are obviously governance measures that we can have, but you know what they say always, you know regulations are behind technology. So uh, to some extent, we want to discuss the uh, the implications of these data breaches and ethical reasons behind it, and, and uh, obviously the legal side of it, as well as what technology can do to tackle problems like this. Um, so just uh, to be clear uh, about what you're talking about, uh, what we are hoping to achieve in this session is a, a good discussion about uh, how uh, privacy can be integrated in applications that we build uh, to have privacy by design to avoid problems like what we face in, uh, in, in a specific use case of clear <coughs> uh, Just for those who don't have context, I'll ask uh, Patricia to do a, a more extended uh, overview of what happened in case of Clearview. But uh, on February 26th, they announced uh, finally that uh, there was a very large data breach um, and that was after a while that they were dealing with uh, several lawsuits uh, from a state in the United States. Patricia, can you tell us more about what happened there? Absolutely. So, uh, thank you. The, for those of you who don't know, uh, Clearview AI ended up collecting uh, 3 billion public images from Facebook, Twitter, and other uh, websites. Many of these websites had it in their terms of use that you cannot uh, use their image, the images published on these sites for facial recognition. But uh, they use these images to train facial recognition software uh, and started targeting uh, po local police departments, the FBI, Homeland Security as their client base. Uh, a lot of these clients uh, uh, ended up deploying this uh, in order to uh, track criminals. Uh, in order to identify uh, people who might be victims of trafficking. Uh, but it's very unclear who decides what a good use is of the facial recognition software and who doesn't. And uh, one of the reasons why you might want to integrate privacy in this is because it makes it look really bad for the clients of uh, this company that they're using this software. And the data breach actually affected those clients because uh, it was basically a list of all of the customers that Clearview AI has. Uh, so um, retrospectively, had they used privacy, 
uh, technology and done this in a way that was more ethical, uh, these clients would not be in the hot water that they are now. Uh, thanks, Patricia. Just to give a little more context, uh, uh, the, the hack involved uh, the names of uh, users, the number of accounts they had, uh, mm -hmm. and even the number of searches. They, they claimed that they did not access the search history of the clients. Uh, and the clients are from, you know, uh, law enforcement all the way to Best Buy. And the use cases for these clients were things like finding persons of interest. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently, uh, they were harvesting uh, public images from uh, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Venmo, and LinkedIn. And pretty much all of these companies have told uh, the company to stop harvesting because that violates their uh, privacy laws. And there are also lawsuits about them violating the state privacy mm -hmm. and data broker laws. Facial uh, recognition is so, banned in a lot of places. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So uh, I guess uh, just to, to dig a little deeper in this, uh, I'm going to ask you, Matthew, is this a new phenomena or is, has it been going on? And uh, if, if it is something that is profitable for people, they're going to keep doing it. Uh, so uh, what is what is your take on this? Well, OK, I, I, I guess how generally to interpret your question. Um, uh, I'm going to I'm going to take liberties and interpret it super generally the, the you could say that this is just another sample of what you call surveillance capitalism, you know, people collecting data under one <coughs> set of uh, terms and conditions and then hey presto ended up using it in some other way when basically they think of a way to make money on it now this is this particular situation is a little more complicated since uh the 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 people who surveilled us originally um namely uh facebook twitter and so forth uh their business models may depend on harvesting private information but in this case it wasn't them that's that, that are gaining the the advantage it's it's clear view ai um but fundamentally the problem i think is pretty is, is the underlying problem is the same and that's that since our privacy laws are let's just call them behind for lack of a better phrase um the capitalists are uh exploiting business ideas that probably are pretty predictable as being unacceptable to a lot of a lot of folks who are surrendering the data um but they're going ahead and doing it anyways for, for different reasons i mean google because it turns out click through advertising's worth a ton of money you know uh, uh et etc cetera, et cetera, a clear view for a completely different idea so i mean i think this whole notion of uh, surrendering data pe to people under terms and conditions that change constantly is uh, is a really big problem in our society that that we're going to have to uh, address and and uh, so so that's perhaps I think the most um, general aspect to this this whole situation um, whether harvesting the images is okay or not um, is 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 almost a detail uh, from the perspective of the people who the images are are, are are being used I'd love to to hear Omar's take on on uh, on on my pretty amateurish speculation about legalities no it's not i think we uh it's kind of interesting because i love these interdisciplinary type of exchanges um it's not amateurish at all uh matt it's it's just slightly different perspectives uh looking at this situation for example i see clearview's use of what they refer to as publicly available images uh as being quite problematic in fact if you look at um, where they were getting these informa this information from, where it was Twitter, it was YouTube, it was Facebook. It's true that individuals upload their photos and images to those sites, but those sites have their own terms and conditions. And so Clearview wasn't going and saying, hey, can I get the information from you? They were typically using bots, as I understand it, to sort of scrape this information and, and, and be able to compare and contrast. And so they're breaking the terms and conditions of those websites. So it's a private entity, third party company that is uh, going to other third party entities, getting information about individuals without their use and knowledge and consent. Uh, the interjurisdictional aspects of this as well makes it incredibly complex because 
Uh, yes, we're here in Canada, but whose laws apply when the individual's rights that we're looking at might be Canadian in orientation, but the entities that are doing it might be based in the US, operating somewhere in Europe, and the data is stored or processed somewhere else in the world in an entirely different jurisdiction. And so whose laws apply still is a very open and difficult question. Uh, Correct me definitely. if I'm wrong, Omar. It seems to me like under the GDPR, uh, you need to have opt-in consent from users whose data is being uh, processed or analyzed for any purpose before being able to go through with it. So if they were using any European data, they would have had to do get opt-in consent. Otherwise, they'd be in violation of the GDPR. Yeah, it didn't even take us 10 minutes to get into GDPR, but GD, that, thank you for that. Um, the GDPR has been absolutely fascinating because, uh, again, we don't really know where the delineation of those responsibilities begin and end. If you are doing business and operating and, uh, you know, interacting with European Union citizens, then yes, GDPR is going to cover it without a question. But whether the information is stored and it's information about someone not in the EU um, and then is being processed somewhere else, it's still an open question. Uh, initially, the European Union took a very hard stance where they said, you know, any information that flows through our jurisdiction has to comply with this. But that's been soft and somewhat just given the nature of data flows. Uh, but I do need to take a step back here and I say part of the reason why the EU um, has been capable of even developing this concept uh, and protections of GDPR is that they have grounded the notion of privacy as a human right. And so this goes back 10, 15 years. There's a number of different statutes and, and, and movements that have occurred that have allowed them to do that. In Canada, it doesn't exist in the same way. It, it just doesn't. We do have a right to privacy that can be found in our charter uh, in Section 8, but that's a right to privacy as it relates to search and seizure from law enforcement. And so the reason why Clearview becomes interesting is because one of the primary users of their software was law enforcement. And so we then start to get into this type of charter human rights protected obligations. But outside of that, we're left with some very inadequate statutes with PIPIDA and the Privacy Act that don't provide the same type of robust protections towards Canadians as we'd otherwise like. How about uh, uh, specifically it, with respect to it being a threat to civil liberties? So if you, um, I found a quote that said that, a, uh, that Illinois is suing Clearview AI because uh, Clearview's actions are a threat to civil liberties. Uh, is that something that's state specific or is that something that uh, can be a possible reason to sue them from Canada? Well, yes, yeah, certainly. I think all laws are very jurisdiction specific. And so that includes, um, you know, Illinois versus Ontario, very different legal systems, similar in structure in that they're both common law systems, but the laws would be very specific. Um, there have been developments and changes, though, even in the past few years when it comes to privacy law. And so what we haven't seen, unfortunately, in Canada and in Ontario specifically, is enough of what we would describe as statutory reforms, so new statutes that provide robust protections. Now, the federal government has made an announcement over the past year for having a digital charter, and that digital charter would seek to provide, I would say, roughly equivalent type of protections and understandings of what we see in EU with the GDPR, but uh, nothing has actually happened in that respect. And, and our courts have been struggling with this now for quite some time. And so what has happened in, instead is that the courts themselves have created what we call a new privacy tort. Um, torts are basically your civil action, your ability to sue other individuals privately in civil law. And so they have found those um, theoretical basis for creating that type of tort in the U.S. in jurisdictions like Illinois. And over the past few years have introduced now three different privacy torts that allow Ontarians to actually have a private right of action. Now, other jurisdictions to complicate it further, even within Canada, haven't adopted the same type of approach because, for example, BC, looking at the first of those privacy torts that was originated in Ontario uh, in 2012, said, well, we had the Privacy Act that actually does have 
an ability for an individual to sue another individual for breaches of privacy. And so they haven't adopted it on a common law perspective. So um, yes, there are tools for that to happen. It could happen in Ontario. Uh, I think what we would probably want to see is some very clear indication that uh, residents in Ontario were adversely affected from the use of this data and then find a law firm that was willing to take on that challenge. But it would be, it would definitely be a complex litigation. Mm -hmm. Mark, here's a, a sort of a, a non-privacy law related question for you. Um, so hackers are subject to all sorts of laws to do with unauthorized access of computer assets, right? And, and uh, you know, admittedly, Facebook and Twitter and all those things. I mean, what constitutes authorized action is is <coughs> complicated. I'm sure. Um, is it absolutely impossible to to craft laws that would make the kind of um, uh, harv bot harvesting that Clearview has done just plain illegal, like some form of unauthorized ac access? Well, again, I think the that is in contract. It's, it doesn't have to be illegal. It's the terms and services that are on any of those websites, any of those social media platforms, they have never authorized that type of disclosure of information. And I think if any of the users of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube were to come to a conclusion that those social media platforms were releasing that information to a company like Clearview, then they would have some major issues. I, I think this is um, going to be our next frontier, which is privacy, but not just privacy. It's about how that information is being used. And so Going back to uh, Patricia's point, right? Yes, it's a civil liberties issue if this information is being used to track individuals as to their geographic location at any given time. Uh, these are entirely uncharted territories and uh, the law is many years behind in terms of catching up. Uh, I, I want to uh, shift the conversation a little to, uh, to our next discussion point. Uh, so. Uh, it's interesting that in, in their uh, press release, uh, they said that data breaches are a part of life in 21st century, uh, which is a very interesting statement. And, you know, it is up to debate to see if we actually accept that. Uh, so let's let's talk about uh, another aspect of this problem. So uh, they, they also say on their website that they have helped the law enforcement to track down a lot of criminals. Um, including pedophiles, terrorists, sex traffickers, um, and also they, they helped uh, identify uh, vulnerable people, like if they were uh, subject to child abuse uh, and financial fraud. Um, so the, the surveillance tools like this uh, definitely have a positive aspect when it comes to law enforcement. And even in, in the case of uh, COVID-19 that we're all dealing with, we've seen you know, governments like China have extensively used surveillance to control the spread of the virus. So the, the question uh, that comes up is, what is the border between good use and bad use? Um, I, I would like to hear Matthew's point of view there. Gosh, well, I mean, that's... <laughs> That's a, as old as technology itself, you know. I mean, nuclear energy started out as a emergency, you know, bomb making uh, uh, exercise, and and uh, you remember, well, we, probably none of you do, but turned into free electricity for all for a while, and and um, you know, then turned into a ecological disaster waiting for a place to happen, you know, and 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 so similarly. Um, uh, uh, our, our technologies are, 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 can be used. Well, the, the problem is that, that if, when you want to go fast and break things, to quote our favorite uh, tech exec, the, the, um, uh, you don't have time for circumspection, you know? And, and um, of course I'm referring to Facebook and, and uh, things like the APIs that they published without um, really finishing the way they, they their authorization code worked that led to completely crazy side effects like um, uh, Cambridge Analytica and, and nobody would say that was a good use of technology I don't think you know identifying people who you could bombard with fake news to, 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 to induce them to not follow their democratic uh, um, 
rights, uh, to vote, I mean, uh, is not a good use of technology. However, an API to allow people to, you know, write apps that traverse friend networks quite possibly might be, you know. Um, uh, uh, so, so I think the problem with innovation in, 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 in a society like ours is that we absolutely have to depend on the better nature of innovators to, to some extent, you know, and, and um, our, our society, um, well, as Americans will say to Europeans, if we had instituted something like GDPR uh, a decade or so ago, there would be no Facebook, uh, you know, Instagram, et cetera. So, so somewhere along the line, the, the balance between going fast and breaking things and suffering, you know, hopefully temporary uh, setbacks like Cambridge Analytica and like I hope Clearview AI turns out to be, um, is, is, is sort of an inevitable part of innovating quickly. Um, I, 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 I have, having taught uh, uh, the, the actions of Ned Ludd, you know, for a couple of years now, I'm beginning to realize that being a Luddite is not altogether a bad thing. You know, sometimes, sometimes in fact, um, being a Luddite uh, it protect, pr protects you from, from over-enthusiasm and, and, and um, being charitable to Facebook, making mistakes, acts of omission that lead to other people's uh, um, uh, exploitive acts. So, so I guess the optimist in me says, well, you know, even the Americans will eventually act um, if, if enough, if Clearview AI starts affecting enough voters' lives, in their opinion. Um, and the pessimist in me says, well, perhaps not, because the kind of monopolies we're seeing develop in, in um, technology companies, sort of Silicon Valley, venture cap funded technology companies, the concentration of power that's, that's, that's developing there uh, might be such to the, 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 that a bad person in charge of one of those operations would be very hard to rein in. So, so I think I've highly non answered uh, the question, but but um, opened up the the topic a little bit. This is really tough, right? This is innovation is is has done a lot of good for us. You know, I, I don't want to push the myth of progress or anything, but it has in a lot of ways. Um, and 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 yet again and again, we have our we find ourselves in this position of being on our heels for a little while. So Omar and all his legal brethren will figure out the solution before too long, and that'll be that, right, Omar? Well, I hope not. I think as I've sort of uh, alluded to already, the legal system is having a very hard time applying antiquated statutes, antiquated principles to new social problems. And so um, I turn it around and actually say the opposite, that if this is a social issue that is of significance, which I think it very much is, then it's up to society and the legislature and, uh, and, and all of the resources that the legislature has in terms of having committees and studies and trying to find what that appropriate balance is. That's really where uh, we should be deciding where we actually figure out we're going to draw the line. Because I agree, being overly enthusiastic from a technological perspective has, has challenges, but doing absolutely nothing is what gives rise to a situation like Clearview. And I think to go back to uh, the, the initial question, it's not the technology or even, you know, from my perspective, um, facial recognition technology specifically that is the challenge here. It's about how Clearview specifically had used that technology. And so uh, it is being increasingly perceived as being one of those bad actors to the extent where even those uh, those claims that they've made about you know protecting people and saving people and stuff like that, they have received cease and desist letters from law enforcement saying you can't make that claim anymore, specifically related to that suspect or that person that was apprehended because we didn't use your technology for that purpose. In other words, they have themselves lost a lot of credibility by perhaps exaggerating. Uh, not a little bit, but exaggerating a lot, what their capabilities are and what their utility is. Um, and so that loss of trust is actually a very, very important component. If we're finding solutions, if we're trying to figure out where balances are going to be, that has to be done in an open uh, manner where there are open conversations <laughs> with the people whose privacy interests are actually affected. That's how you do it ethically. And, and then you can actually revisit that in periodic intervals to see whether or not we've achieved that balance. 
Awesome. I'll, 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 Patricia, go ahead. Yeah, I would uh, be very cautious of associating innovation quickly with throwing ethics out the window, right? Uh, if, if you are innovating quickly and throwing ethics out the window, please stop. I don't want your innovation. I, I don't think society needs your innovation. It can wait a couple of years for you to figure out how to make it in an ethical way. Uh, privacy technology in particular is going to, is ramping up very quickly. So we will have the capabilities of offering something like Clearview AI, which doesn't uh, impact ethics, doesn't impact the privacy of people who have uh, nothing to do with who you're looking for. Uh, so the, this isn't a priority in the world right now. It's not gonna save millions of lives. Uh, and if it were something that we're supposed to be saving millions of lives, uh, I guess that's the interesting question. When is innovating quickly for that going to trump ethics? Okay, well, so now I think I'm we're seeing that now, right? Yeah. I mean, COVID-19, I would make the case that the fact that we've passed statutes uh, that have never been passed in this way before, we're suspending operations in ways that had never happened before, now would be a justifiable time to actually, I would argue, intrude on those privacy interests slightly. The, the challenge here would be is that it has to be time limited. I think that's the whole point. If we're saying that the emergency warrants us to actually innovate and do it immediately, we should have an end to that. Mm -hmm. it, sales tax was supposed to have an end to it after uh, the World War, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm not very hopeful that uh, time limits actually work. Okay, so so um, I don't know. I, I'm terrible. I'm torn to go in two ways. So I'm, I'm first of all, the first thing I wanted to say was one of the problems here is I think pretty fundamental. I, I may be just sort of um, uh, uh, broadcasting my my own um, lack of general knowledge about law, but um, as, as I teach a course in, in this, and so I went around asking for people to tell me what's a better alternative to deal with privacy than this notion of a privacy tort and just to just to review for just one sec the, the notion is that you know the way our law works right now is that somebody violating your right to be left alone is kind of like somebody driving over your fence right that, that if your neighbor backs over your fence they've hurt you they've done you a damage it's a tort and that privacy is similar, okay? And and so that's sort of the 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 concept that we have to work with right now. Um, but we need a more broad concept. I mean, I think that's part of the problem. And 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 um, there aren't very many out there. The 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 only one that that I've heard that's convincing to me, and I'm maybe I'll be that Omar can list off a bunch more, is this notion of a fiduciary. You know, the the it's pretty common to have on the board of directors. Uh, people, the, the, if you're on the board of directors in the, on the company, you're you're obliged to act in the interest of that company's financial, you know, benefit. Well, perhaps a similar sort of concept could be used for privacy. You know, if you're running a private company, that 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 company that takes people's private information, you should be f obliged to act as a fiduciary to treat that privacy sort of as if it was your own. But I mean. I, I, I'm sure I don't have to convince anybody here. It takes a hell of a long time for a concept to go from something as um, sort of loosey goosey as that to a law that you can use to run a multi-trillion-dollar industry, right? And 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 so I think that's where we sit right now as a society, as a technology industry. And and um, um, okay, so that's that's point one. But I don't, don't want to let let I'll return to the COVID privacy thing in a minute because we've been talking about that a lot. So I'm I'm muting and I'm I'm all ears, Omar. I, I, sure, I can respond to that briefly. I mean, um, sure, it takes a long time. That's part of the reason why the laws move so slowly. But privacy is not a new concept. I mean, in its historical context, it was the whole notion that the castle, the home is the castle, and analogy of trespassing, right? You're intruding into my home. But this notion of digital privacy and digital rights and, and what privacy means in a digital era has been around now for a couple decades. 
So we have case law that's been discussing it for a couple decades. It's not so new It's about how far do we go and if something is taken on temporarily, does it become permanent? Uh, but at the same time, maybe we've been a little bit too restrictive about how we actually do this. And so there's a lot of uh, ideas that have been bounced around. There's, there's a concept like a digital wallet, for example, or a digital dossier, where the user, the individual citizen, has a choice of what is included in that, what is not included in that. That's been floated around both academically as well as through think tanks and people that are designing legislation. That's another way of doing it. Uh, and so the reason for looking at those alternatives, it's also a question about where does the responsibility lie? Is it with the individual, which is where that last concept comes from? Is it with a private corporation? I mean, are they the ones who are responsible because they are going to be regulated, right? So businesses, it's not a right to be able to make money, right? Corporations are good from a capitalistic perspective. Other societies have other values, but we regulate how they make that money. And so we can limit their use of whatever might be polluting into the river, but also capturing people's information and using it inappropriately. Or alternatively, does the responsibility rest with government? And I think the reason why I've come back to that point a couple times now is that we are unique from perhaps our American neighbors, where their, their very gen, um, genesis, the creation of their country, was very anti-government in orientation, right? They were formed very much by a revolution. Whereas, although we did have some violent conflict with, you know, the crown, uh, it was more a matter of, well, maybe we're going to be socially distancing from Britain more and more and more. And it, you know, will take us 100, 150 years to, to really become our own country. Um, and we still maintain that monarch as a figurehead there, right? And so, so that history informs our perspective of the role of government. And whereas the Americans are much more distrustful of government and much more readily willing to allow the corporate interests to dictate which way we go in, in terms of this. Canadians, in terms of our values, and it's similar in that respect to the Europeans, uh, have frequently looked to government for these types of solutions. In no, part, uh, I think government would have a, government or some regulatory body would have a good place in saying the good outweighs the bad. And in the case of, I'm going to bring it back to coronavirus, I'm sorry. <laughs> in the case of collecting location data from people uh, to make sure that coronavirus isn't spreading, I mean, it's very difficult to me to see how, one, that could be integrated in a reliable way. You could just leave your cell phone at home, for example, and no one will know you left the house under this. Uh, or two... Uh, your view would. <laughs> Clearview would, maybe. They have a 75% accuracy on security cameras. Uh, that's, a, that's another point. Uh, in part, a lot of the, the capabilities that you allow to extend uh, to the public space will start collecting more and more data that we don't understand how it interconnects, right? So we're not only, we're, we shouldn't only be worried about this one camera collecting our information uh, or a whole set of cameras in the city collecting our information. How does that data look when you aggregate it with other publicly available or privately available information? And we don't know, right? We don't, we have tech, technical people don't know and uh, legal people who work in law don't know. So I think it would make sense to be very cautious when it comes to allowing any of this to happen in a time of uh, in, a, in a time of a pandemic, that's a super. Now, there's there's that, that's the segue to the thing I wanted to spit out here, and that's that, you know, um, it turns. Okay, so so obviously, people that hang around computer science departments have been thinking, how could we make an app that would help with uh, tracking, you know, uh, tracking cases. So so the the kind of the the obvious way to do it is to just anoint, you know, Facebook or somebody to say some advertising uh, uh, company because they track location a lot to, to, okay, you just, you know, do the calculations. Tell me when I've come in contact with someone with COVID, right? And then, so if you think about it for a while mm -hmm. and, and, and you think, wait a minute, from the perspective of, no, surely there's a way of doing that same social purpose without giving away your location to a central player. And there is like with a, with a, not a lot of crypto, you, you can do this thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, 
a, a couple of me and a couple of my colleagues had this sort of oh my goodness it's a bloody trojan horse you know that 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 what what happened in china at least partially was uh the government using this crisis as an opportunity to to turn on stuff in alibaba software that really you know you it, it would have been very hard to sell without a crisis in the background so that's like a hundred percent you know to your point patricia that 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 um crisis every, every crisis what's that famous quote about never missing a, a a good never miss a good crisis i think it's a political kind of you know truism anyway so so um absolutely it's not the it's not the crisis that you're solving that matters it's 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 the potential damage of the data that you're that you're um, making public or or exploiting that that, that we need to consider. But I, I still think Omar that that we need a more general principle other than this kind of feeling of your home is your castle to to um, to describe to to the rest of society why this thing that we've unleashed upon them needs needs to be reined in now. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm gonna quickly try to summarize uh, what we talked about so far uh, and move on to the next topic. Um, so it looks like we all agree that uh, intrusion on uh, you know, privacy uh, using data uh, as a default is, is something that we don't like and we don't want to exist, except in cases where uh, you know, we uh, we have some sort of limit in how and who is using that data. Uh, for example, uh, seems like we're okay with our own governments, like the Western governments, access to that data because they can help with, uh, you know, uh, with you know terrorism, uh, terrorism, and and other type of uh, problems that societies have. But you know, a good question there is. What are the assumptions about who we trust about accessing that data, and um, and other types of limits that we talked about? For example, time limit, like how long can you have uh, that kind of access for that kind of use case? Uh, and as Omar pointed out, uh, you know, it is it is regulations and legal legalese that are uh, not going to really solve this problem anytime soon because it takes a while for them to take all aspects into account and build a, a kind of a solution that really captures what we need. Uh, so it, it brings me to the question that given, and even we talked about consent, like should we ask the consumer's explicit consent uh, about the usage? And what are the assumptions of intent when uh, the, uh, the consumer consents to a particular use? Like if we all, all of a sudden want to use the data differently, like. In, in Clearview uh, case, people were uploading to Facebook thinking that they're sharing with their friends. And now there is a completely different use case. The company wants to use it for surveillance. Should we go back and ask, OK, here's a new intent. Do you consent to it? But I think the bigger problem is, even if we collect that consent, um, in cases like data breaches, uh, there are bad actors. There are governments that have no uh, tradition of privacy. And they don't show any intent of moving in that direction. So it sounds like all of these are pointing us back to the fact that we might have to use technology to address this problem. So I'm, I'm curious to hear Patricia's point of view on uh, what can be done, how can we move forward? Mm -hmm. I would also add that uh, even if we trust our governments now, well, one, it doesn't mean we necessarily should because we don't know what that data is being used for uh, or what it will be used for in the near future. For example, uh, uh, ICE, for all we know, could be using this uh, in order to continue the raids that they're still doing uh, to uh, extract illegal immigrants from the United States. And that is a danger for uh, the population because it could keep spreading the coronavirus. Um, and the other thing is, mm, Governments can turn on a dime, right? We we don't know who our next government is going to be. We don't know how much power they're going to uh, necessarily have and what their perspective is going to be on data. Uh, so it's really up to developers to think what the possible users uh, are of their software, uh, what those users could use it for. And I have heard developers say, uh, I just make the software. It, it's up to... 
uh, the customers to make sure that it's uh, compliant with the law, right? So I would argue that that's a very bad way of building a society and software. Uh, so the kind of things that you could look at if you are trying to build privacy preserving software is, uh, of course, uh, things like differential privacy when you're training your models. Um, and that allows for uh, generalizing, uh, making generalizations about the data that you're training on, right? So the interesting part there is that you're training models that actually are better at generalization and not at uh, identifying the uh, quirks of a particular individual, which, which ends up giving you better results anyway. Uh, you could, if you're looking for database, uh, through databases, you could use differential privacy on the queries to add a little bit of noise uh, to how many users, uh, how many people in this database have uh, X disease uh, with X characteristics, Y characteristics. Then you can have an approximate number and make, uh, again, a generalization about the population. Now, it's interesting when it comes to making very specific um, inferences about data, uh, you can't use differential privacy, then you have to look at alternatives, uh, like using homomorphic encryption, using secure multi-party computation, using an anonymization. Uh, and those are a little bit more technically involved. Yes. Could you define a couple of those fascinating things that you just uh, uh, mentioned? Absolutely. OK. So. So uh, homomorphic encryption allows you to uh, perform calculations on encrypted data. So you can imagine encrypting a two, encrypting a three, adding them together, and you get an encrypted five. When you decrypt, you could get the five. Um, the general um, example for that is your, your, your cell phone is producing some data. You encrypt it. You send it to the cloud for processing. Uh, the cloud uh, calculates entirely on the encrypted data and sends you the result back, okay? So uh, there are certain limitations, like you can only uh, perform polynomial operations uh, or appro approximations of polynomial functions. So uh, the good, uh, for those of you who don't, haven't done math in a while, x squared plus x plus one, for example, would be a polynomial. Um, or an addition would, be, would count as a polynomial. Uh, so there's that. There's also secure multi-party computation, which allows for you to uh, perform computations across multiple parties' data. So if you uh, if you want to make sure one that uh, the result doesn't make any sense unless enough parties input some data into the algorithm, uh, and two that none of the parties know each other's data, but everybody can know the results, that's when you want to use secure multi-party computation. And anonymization is something that private AI works on. So we anonymize uh, images, video, and also uh, text uh, by removing uh, locations, uh, names, uh, other personal identifiable information from text, and faces and license plate numbers from images and video. So you can still tell what's going on in terms of topic. You can still tell uh, if there's violence going on in an image or a video feed. Uh, but you don't need the people's faces. You could get a warrant to get that information. So can I jump in there real quick? I really like that uh, idea of um, you know the the aggregation of that information without disclosing personal information. The challenge that I see with that is that what you know we have to take a step back and think about what is it that we're talking about when we talk about privacy. And mm -hmm. so, based on that privacy tort that was introduced in 2012 in Ontario, that one case described it as being issues around employment. Um, financial information, sexual practices and orientation, or a diary or private correspondence, all of which would be considered highly offensive if someone was to review it, but it also included things like health and medical records. So that mm -hmm. was our definition of privacy in the Ontario context, which is pretty, I would say, standard um, for perhaps Western societies in terms of what the ideas that we want to protect. But if we're looking at other cultures and other countries around the world, uh, I think this is part of the point that Amir was saying, is that privacy is not that they don't have a notion of privacy. It's that the notion of privacy is understood in a very different way. And so when we're connecting then different data points, it makes it a little bit more challenging because what we consider to be protected and what should be protected is very different. Uh, and, and I think the argument that would be made in places in jurisdictions like China or other places is like, Yes, the government has to step in, 
But at the end of the day, we're saving lives. And so if it's a matter of balancing values, saving lives should always be the number one value. And that's where it's great that we're having this conversation, you know, generally, but uh, in a very, very real way, we're going to see the impact on lives uh, in our community around us in the next few weeks. Mm. The, the question there is, is there anything else that can be used to save lives as efficiently or nearly as efficiently that doesn't violate privacy, especially as, at a massive scale? And the answer will probably be yes. Maybe, but I think part of that challenge will be also compliance, right? So there's a values component there as well, because um, you can actually say in what, they're, what are described as more collectivist cultures, that doing this course of action, this plan will be better for everybody. In more individualistic societies like our own, that type of messaging doesn't work as well. In fact, we've seen this now in Italy, and uh, we're seeing it happen right now in the US, and unfortunately, to a certain extent in Canada, where people are still flouting social distancing uh, directives because freedom, right? And so it, it does come back to when we're talking about ethics, ethics is inherently intertwined with values and values is always very jurisdictional and community specific and they change over time. Uh, mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about maintaining ethics, when we're actually employing technology like this, what is ethical is it, like I said, changes over time, but also it also changes depending on the communities that you're discussing and involving. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Well, okay. So uh, if I may, sorry, just very quickly, if I may jump in, I think uh, I think what you both are saying is is consistent. I think what Patricia is saying is that we can have uh, privacy by design and included in in our software designs. Uh, and you know the, the exact privacy rules and designs that we use is definitely dependent on the specific culture we're talking about, a specific country, their values, etc. But I think that the point is still very valid that uh, it is important for even developers to start thinking about in what ways can my software and data be used uh, and take a proactive approach in uh, trying to protect the end users. Uh, sorry, Matthew. Uh, well, no, thank you. I think um, there's a sort of a, a thing that our industry has tried for a while, which is loosely speaking, uh, security through obscurity. You know, the the you kind of put enough barriers uh, in front of the hackers, and you you uh, um, uh, you 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 make it more and more difficult for anything but the cleverest programmers to get access. And you go, ah, that's privacy, right? And and um, Truth be told, that 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 that's not really privacy. The, the kind of pri privacy is something like, you know, uh, public key encryption, where where all the king's horses and all the king's men can't get this piece of data that 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 you've got squirreled away somewhere. So so people like Patricia pushed this to new new levels, and and that makes me think um, two things. One is that you know in times of crisis, maybe uh, the best mathematicians can't always be mobilized and we we need something like uh you know emergency regulations along the ones that our current prime minister's father once had to employ and maybe this prime minister will have to employ it as well um and and uh and i'm sure canadians to to i can't remember whose point would have a very different response to that than americans would you know and and thank goodness for that you know the the every once in a while uh, uh you need to you need to declare that you can't figure this problem out correctly but that being said you know uh something i say to my students all the time is you know in our grandfather's day it was security guards that protected your privacy you know like your medical records were in a locked room and it was the guy within the uniform that protected them and now it's basically us you know it's the computer programmers that protect privacy and it's just not good enough to use obscurity anymore you know like we have to learn more about crypto and and uh things like homomorphic uh, uh what did you call it encryption encryption homomorphic yeah encryption. um uh is is like it would be so cool if you didn't have to worry about hackers stealing the database because the database is always encrypted. It doesn't have to be de-encrypted to, to do your actual transaction. So, so I mean, I, I think that that's perhaps the challenge is a little bit on us, you know, how to get computer programmers in the 
couple six four six short years we have them one more super sophisticated skill is obviously a challenge but i i i i hope that the kinds of conversations that we're having now underscore how important that is you know uh, um that also speaks to ethics right the there's the, 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 these absolute cop-outs that you hear of well if i don't do it somebody else will and you know um if i don't do that i'll lose my job like those are those are you know you know those are cowardly acts that, that sometimes you know need to be done but i think most uh, an awful lot of our graduates leave without any impression at all that that they might be facing a choice like that you know uh, um so anyways the 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 our, our ethics courses typically aren't um mandatory uh uh perhaps what perhaps they should be um and similarly the, the, the some of these notions of secure of, of real privacy they're not compulsory either maybe they should be you know maybe di data scientists should understand how to do calculations without putting things into plain text um anyway I, this is a rant i could do this for quite a long i regularly do this for an hour at a time so i'll stop um but anyways that's i think that's the the kind of the challenge that this is that is before our field at, at the moment i would add to that to say that uh, a at least a slight foundation in history and uh in politics would be very useful in order to make those decisions and developers don't get that necessarily unless they go looking for that education yeah but along the same uh, lines lawyers don't necessarily get the technological uh skills that they need in order unless they go looking for that education as well and so mm -hmm. this is where i really do like i mean i think it's exemplified by this talk uh the interdisciplinary aspect really does mm -hmm. enhance from my perspective the depth of the analysis and the ability to actually foster solutions mm -hmm. Uh, I remember a few uh, a few nights ago you were saying Omar that in Ryerson now you uh, ask uh, uh, law students to also take some coding courses. That's definitely very interesting. It I it is very sad that we have to bring this to an end. It's a very good conversation. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, so can I ask everyone to quickly, you know, give your uh, departing remarks. Omar, do you want to start? Sure, happy to. I was just reading Matt's uh, private message to me. Uh, <laughs> so I think, you know, Clearview, let's, uh, what, what it's done is really brought to the forefront um, some of the, the ways in which this technology can be abused and misused. Uh, and unfortunately, what that does is often get people alarmed. Um, and, and I'm not going to say unnecessarily so, because it really has exemplified and highlighted some of the dangers and the challenges with not having restriction or perhaps better reflection in terms of where the limitations should be. And so what this does give is an opportunity though at the same time for us to say there might be some applications, there might be some uses for us to use technology like facial recognition in particular during a pandemic. I think there's a great opportunity to do that now, but how do we do it in a way that doesn't still give rise to some of the pitfalls that we saw with Clearview. I think that's really uh, the advantage of this narrative is that we were actually being able to have a discussion, not just with theoreticals about what the abuses are, but some very concrete examples of where it can go wrong. Uh, Matthew? Well, yeah, I, I guess my uh, closing is that this is yet another call to action in a year of a bunch of call to actions um, that, that, uh, leaving it to GDPR and stuff like that, you know, I mean, eventually perhaps the law will catch up, but meanwhile, do no harm. I mean, like we, we don't have a Hippocratic oath, but uh, if you're, there's lots of ways to make money in this industry. If you can't think of one uh, that, that, uh, that doesn't involve harming other people, just, you know, go away. The, the do no harm. I would add to that. Patricia, you yeah, uh, I would add sorry, to that by saying, oh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> go for uh, it. <laughs> uh, no, I just wanted to say that you, uh, like uh, Matthew said, that this is a call to action, but you had a few action items. So maybe mm -hmm. you can summarize that again and uh, say your uh, departing comment. Sounds good. So the, the difficult part is that um, developers do have to have a background in uh, privacy technology, oftentimes, uh, in order to integrate that technology into whatever they're building. 
And that's something we're trying to, to solve at Private AI and a, a few other groups are trying to solve as well. Um, but in the meantime, until that problem is actually solved, uh, if you are tempted uh, to build something that you don't feel good about, uh, that might be uh, infringing in privacy or unethical in some way, it's, it's not only bad for the people who might be affected by it, but it's also bad for you, as you can see, uh, the case of Cambridge Analytica, I'm sure the CEO is not very happy right now. Um, I'm sh in Clearview AI, I'm sure the CEO is dealing with a lot of headaches right now. So it's just, it's worth it to just take those extra, that extra month or two to figure out how to do this properly, one for your own image and two for the world. I like that Thank a lot. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank it was you. a great discussion. I hope that the audience also enjoyed it. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoyed the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you, everybody.